good evening. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started here. It's a, a pretty packed agenda tonight, and I'd like to stay uh, as much on time as we can since uh, we've got everybody coming in here in the evening. So thank you very much for coming this evening. Um, my name is Ken Smith. Uh, I'm the director of the Mobility Division at the Stanford Center on Longevity, uh, and I would love to welcome you to the kickoff event for our second, uh, our second design challenge, Enabling Personal Mobility Across the Lifespan. Um, just a bit of housekeeping here. There are restrooms out uh, just across the, the lobby. We're going to have the catering up afterwards, too. So if you didn't get an hors d'oeuvre or a drink on the way in, there will be an opportunity on the way out. Um, if you are choosing to tweet this, uh, live tweet during the event, um, please go ahead and use the hashtag MoveDesign. Um, and we're collecting things on Twitter uh, under that hashtag. So I just wanted to uh, start off by saying a few words about the Stanford Center on Longevity. Uh, for those of you who have not had a chance to get to know us yet, uh, we are an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research center at Stanford University. We uh, were founded in 2006. Our uh, director is Dr. Laura Karstensen, who you'll hear from later on this evening. Uh, our deputy director is Dr. Tom Rando, who is a neurologist uh, and a stem cell biologist uh, who will not be here this evening. Um, Really, the, the intellectual horsepower for the Center on Longevity comes from our faculty affiliate network. We have, uh, it says 140 plus, we're just about at 150 uh, faculty across the university who have uh, looked at our mission and agreed with it and agreed to uh, be involved in any way they can when we can find ways to bring their research to bear. So the Center on Longevity is really looking uh, to redesign long life. Um, it's a very, uh, ambitious and a very broad, broad uh, thing to do, but we believe that you know aging is really one of the uh, the mega trends of of your lifetime, one of our lifetimes. And so, uh, what we look to do is, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more. But what we look to do is we to change culture to catch up with the rates of uh, of our aging society. Um, and we do this under a tagline that uh, Dr. Karstensen mentioned in her book, A Long Bright Future, to the extent that people arrive at old age mentally sharp, physically fit, and financially secure, individuals and societies will thrive. So under that, we're organized with three divisions. We have a mind division that looks at issues around cognition, memory, those sort of things. A mobility division, which I mentioned I direct, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we mo mean by mobility in just a second. Uh, and we also have a financial security division, looking at the way that planning for retirement has changed, uh, looking at the decision to retire. You know, should people still be uh, retiring at 65 in uh, a world where they are now living to much, much older ages? Uh, and we also look at prevention of financial fraud against the elderly. So our program for tonight looks like this. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a kickoff and kind of give you the general sense of uh, why we're doing this challenge and what the challenge is going to be. Uh, I'm going to hand this off then to Stephen Johnston from Aging 2.0. Oh, Katie, are you going to do this? Oh, and Katie Fike, uh, the co-founders of Aging 2.0, who have been uh, our collaborators on the design challenge from almost day one. Um, and then we'll have a couple of great talks for you. And there's a little bit of a program change this evening from what you see written down. Um, originally on your programs, it says that Shelley Fole, who's the director of uh, the executive director of the President's Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition, uh, was going to be speaking. Unfortunately, she was sick this morning and did not get on a plane coming from Washington. Um, Dr. Laura Karstensen, our director, uh, has graciously agreed to speak. And actually, I've seen heard, heard some of her materials, and I think it's going to be very applicable. And I think it'll be a great talk. And happy to have you. And thank you, Laura, for stepping in. Uh, then Dr. Leila Takayama will be representing uh, the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Robotics and Artificial Intelligence. And we'll talk a little bit more about the design side of things. Uh, and then we're going to finish up with something I'm excited to see. Uh, we've just tried it for the first time this year, but uh, it's the results of something that happened a week ago uh, where, and Lauren Grieco, who works at the center, will also tell you a little bit more about this. But basically, uh, a number of older people have been uh, given the lens of design thinking to look through, and then they've been out for a week or two and kind of viewing their world through that lens of design thinking. And we're going to get them back together and talk about that tonight and have a panel discussion from them. And then we'll uh, wrap up and have a little bit of networking out in the lobby and outside. So I'm going to start, as I said, talking about why we choose to do a design challenge like this. 
and what the challenge is going to look like. And apologies for the slides. That actually seemed to work on my computer, so I think it must be uh, translating PC to Mac. Um, normally at this point, I would start out with a number of histograms and pictures of uh, how the world is aging and the fact that um, many more people are having the opportunity to reach old age than ever before. And so we are seeing distributions of age in our society that are really unlike anything that we've seen in, before really in human history. But I think most of the people that come to this probably have a little bit of a sense of that. So I'm cutting to the chase a little bit tonight in the interest of time um, and really saying that, you know, aging is one of the megatrends of our time. And so understanding it and being prepared for it um, is really critical, not just for people who are themselves older, but for people of all ages. Um, and aging has, has happened very, very quickly. Um, in developed countries, the lifespan, the average lifespan at birth has doubled since 1900. Um, so people now you know, living to an average of 82, 84, depending on whether you're talking about uh, men or women. And our culture has really not kept up. The institutions of our society, education, uh, social support networks, retirement ages, really have not had time to catch up to this, you know, huge achievement of, of people living longer. That's happened really, you know, as Laura often says, in the blink of an eye. And so we felt that with this design challenge, we could provide a couple of things. Obviously, we can get um, through the university students and young designers, fresh eyes, new solutions, the kind of things that you might expect out of a design challenge. But even more than that, and probably um, our bigger goal is educating a whole new generation in aging opportunities. Because when young designers are told to design for what they know and uh, when they think about what they want to design for, it's not always obvious that the first thing that comes to mind is I'm going to be designing something for older people. But when you get them engaged and when you get them to know a little bit about the topic, it's one that's very personal because you know everybody has parents, everybody has grandparents, and they begin to come to these uh, design ideas a little bit more organically once you get them going. And what we found out in doing this over the last two years really is that there's a bigger resonant topic in general and that's getting people of all ages working on issues and opportunities for aging people and for older people. And again and again it's resonated and you'll start to see that as we talk about some of the sponsors that have come on board and some of the things that we're doing that beyond just designing products or designing things, it's really this bigger area that has become really exciting. Um, and finally, you know, being Stanford, we would like to take this beyond just the design itself, but also can we provide a, a ramp to seeing these products and these ideas find their way out and actually help people. So we really look to find, you know, a path for people after the design challenge, not just, you know, presenting a, a prize at the end. So why mobility? Um, I wanted to talk a little about how we think about mobility at the Center on Longevity. And it's hard to do that without talking about a concept called compression and morbidity. Does, is anybody, who, who in the audience is familiar with that term? Okay, so a few, but probably worth going through here. So if we look at uh, a graph of age versus quality of life, and I'm, I'm smiling at Laura because you have a slide that says almost anything yeah. relative to age, um, typically looks like that and historically has looked like that. So, you know, generally there's a high quality of life throughout most of youth and middle age, maybe rolls off a little as you get a little older, and then there is this, this drop off with age. Now, back in 1980, there was a professor at Stanford, Jim Fries, who's actually a affiliate of the Center on Longevity, um, that proposed the idea that what we wanted was something like this, where quality of life remains very high, right out to very close to the end of life, and then drops off very quickly. Um, and that's known as compression and morbidity. Uh, and if you notice, the, the end point there doesn't actually move a whole lot. I mean, certainly life extension is, is great, but really what we're more concerned with is the quality of life you know, over the full lifespan. So you're gonna hear us, and actually I'm gonna go back here. Um, so, so we look at this in a couple of different ways. You know, you can preserve this quality of life by prevention. You can talk about how you can get people to exercise more, to eat better, to keep them up on that line. Um, you can talk about ways that when mobility restrictions start to occur, because I would maintain that mobility is a pretty good proxy for quality of life. I mean, the ability to get around by yourself in the world, um, not have to necessarily depend on others, um, is a pretty good proxy there. And I think 
you can also find ways where as mobility issues start to crop up, you've seen lots of developments in the medical field. I mean, artificial joints, uh, um, lots of, you know, those sort of things that are actually more what I would call interventions rather than prevention. And then out here, when you incur mobility issues that uh, can't necessarily be fixed, we talk about accommodation or changing the world around you in a way that allows quality of life to remain high even with mobility issues. And so you're going to see that reflected you know, in the design challenge. Now, I wanted to talk specifically about physical activity because it comes up again and again. And this is a list that I came across that's actually in the federal guidelines for physical activity from 2008. So it reads like something that, you know, someone with a, a supplement that was trying to, you know, sell the cure-all would be, right? And, you know, this is from the government. And so you can see the number of things that are affected by physical activity. And it's the things that you would expect, like, like uh, cardiovascular disease. But also you start to see, you know, lower risks of cancer, uh, prevention of falls. It's, it's good for depression. Um, and then even last year when we had our finals, which were around cognitive issues, uh, Frank Longo, who's a doctor at Stanford and one of the leading experts on Alzheimer's, actually made a, a statement that stuck with me. And he said, we've got one drug that's actually been scientifically validated to be correlated to a reduction in Alzheimer's. It's free. Everybody can get at it, and no one will take it and it's exercise. Um, so there's the but, is that we, I think, I don't think if I took a poll of this audience that there would be lots of people that would try to argue against the benefits of exercise. Um, but as a society, our numbers are not getting better. Um, the, the percentage of people who are getting no exercise or very little exercise um, have not only not gotten better, they've, they've gotten worse in terms of purely sedentary behavior. Uh, a recent study came out looking at the, uh, the National Health and Nutrition Survey data, and the thing that jumped out was really that the number of people reporting no physical activity during leisure time actually significantly increased from the 1990 time frame to around 2010. So we're going the wrong direction, and we need to find some solutions to this. Um, one indication of how important this is and that we're hitting on a topic that people actually care about is that um, one of our key collaborators on this is the President's Council on Physical, Physical Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition. Um, we've recently signed a memorandum of understanding between the Center on Longevity uh, and the President's Council to help them expand their agenda. Um, they are really looking to help Americans of all ages, but most of their programming has been for kids in you know, K through 12. I think everybody knows about the Presidential Physical Fitness Challenge, and we, we kid about doing push-ups since the Eisenhower administration. That's these guys. And they're looking to really expand their agenda to include older Americans, and we're looking to help them do that. Um, as I mentioned, Shelley Fole, their executive director, was originally planning on speaking tonight, and she um, sends her regrets that she couldn't make it, um, and we hope to have her out here in the future. So with that background, this is the challenge this year. It's enabling personal mobility across the lifespan, and what we are looking for are solutions to reduce those sedentary lifestyles that we talked about, to encourage and enable physical movement and exercise, and to break down the barriers in the home and the community that might prevent that. And once again, this is a challenge that's open to the entire world. Any university in the world can enter. Um, we have $10,000 for first prize, $5,000 for second, $2,000 for third. Um, we will be selecting finalists in January, and Stephen and Katie are gonna talk a little about this, uh, this timeline in a minute here. But we'll select finalists in January, and we'll actually bring those finalists physically here to Stanford to present in front of companies and investors and academics and you know, give them a chance to really um, get to know the people that can actually help their, their designs find their way out into the world. I mentioned that we did this last year. That last year was our first year of the challenge. And our topic was maximizing independence for those with cognitive impairment. Interestingly enough, there was numbers in there previously. But um, we had 52 entries last year representing 31 universities in 15 different countries. So we were actually really happy with the scope that we were able to achieve geographically. Um, and even beyond that, we were happy with the scope of what we were able to see in those solutions that came in. So these were the first, second, and third place winners from last year. Um, first place was uh, Xiao Yao from uh, the Academy of Art Institute in San Francisco that reimagined what uh, a place setting would look like for people with Alzheimer's disease. Beautiful job of, um, of user-centered design. And in fact, Sha I'm looking for here is here somewhere. Oh, there, there she is. And so we're happy to see you come back this year.
twice. What's that? She cannot win twice. She cannot win. Well, she could win twice. Well, actually, she's not a student anymore, so no. <laughs> Sorry, you're too old already. Um, and I, I think uh, if, if any of you wants to hear the story of, you know, that it's not easy to necessarily get from idea to product, I think uh, Shaw can meet with you over, over a drink later. Um, but as an indication of kind of the breadth of what we saw from a discipline perspective, second place was actually this group from the National University of Singapore that produced a spoon that has a battery in it and electrodes on the bottom that actually electrically stimulates taste buds to increase the taste in people who may, fee, may see experience diminishing taste with uh, dementia or, or cognitive impairment. Um, and then third place was this uh, team from the Copenhagen Institute of Interactive Design that you, that had a solution for really mapping memories for people with very early stage cognitive impairment to capture those memories and to put them together in a way that could help them as they experienced you know, further impairment and also keep them in a way that their family could cherish as well. So that's all I'm gonna say. As I mentioned, uh, the folks from Aging 2 are gonna talk a little about the details, but I do definitely have to take a few minutes here to talk about our sponsors. Um, you can imagine running a worldwide challenge like this, bringing people from all over the world, um, we could not do by ourselves. And so I want to recognize a few people here, and happily this list is getting longer, so it may take me a couple of minutes, but I, a happy thing to do. So I first want to recognize uh, Russ Hill and the New Retirement Forum. Russ couldn't be here tonight, um, but they were, Russ and the New Retirement Forum was really our founding sponsor for the challenge, and so I always want to go back and uh, thank him and he again is part of the sponsorship this year. Um, we are happy to have the Davis Finney Foundation this year. And in fact, we have some representation here, so thank you very much. Um, no one is here from AARP, but I'm happy to announce AARP as a sponsor of the challenge as well. Um, Jody Holtzman, uh, from, uh, who's the Director of Technology and Innovation, has been our key contact there, and we're really happy to have them on board. This one I'm very excited about, uh, Target is now part of the challenge as well. And what I'm really excited about here beyond just the sponsorship is the recognition of eight products for aging being products for everybody. I mean, Target is about as dead center uh, a retailer as you can imagine. And so having them on board is really a recognition that these issues are becoming mainstream and that the products that we're talking about are really looking to be mainstream products. Um, home care assistance who was one of our sponsors last year, and I think we should have some people from Home Care Assistance here. There you are. Thank you for coming, and thank you for sponsoring again this year. Um, they've been a great source of knowledge about what happens in the home. I mean, they're hands-on with a lot of people at home every day. Um, we have Tideswell at UCSF, which formerly was the program for the Aging Century, and I don't know that we have anyone here this evening. We don't, but we thank them. Um, We'd also like to thank our technology and marketing partners. Uh, Skilled is the platform that we run the challenge on and they've um, definitely been helpful along the way. Uh, the International Council on Active Aging uh, is going to help us promote the challenge worldwide. Age Tech West is again here as a sponsor and uh, you know, as a source of information about technology and how the technology is being used in the aging services industry. Um, and I'm really happy to announce our very first device sponsor, uh, Tile Wellness and Philo and Company is here somewhere. Um, if you haven't seen them, they're, they're actually set up with a demo of their product out in the, uh, the small room next door. And what they have, you'll see, is a, a force measurement device that allows kind of isometric exercise to be built into games and things like that. And what they've offered is they're actually providing 10 of their devices to teams that might want to use them. And what we really want to recognize here is that in this fitness space, in this exercise space, there's been this huge growth in the ability to measure things. And we want our designers to think they don't have to start at ground zero. There are all these tools and platforms that they can work from. And what we'll be judging, of course, is the originality that they bring to things. But uh, we're happy to have somebody here who can actually provide them a device and maybe get some imaginative minds um, you know, working on some new applications. Um, last and certainly not least, I want to um, recognize the Center on Longevity's corporate affiliates who are sponsors with us in a, in a much broader way and work with us on, on all of the things we do. Uh, and I know Andy from Caring.com is here tonight and I, I wanna thank them for their sponsorship. I don't know that we have anyone from uh, any of our other affiliates here this evening. So one last uh, 
special announcement for Stanford students, who I think we have a few in the audience. Um, since we're talking about mobility, this is a very special flavor of mobility, but Dave Jaffe, Dave is here, um, runs a winter quarter class on perspectives and assistive technology where he pairs design students with uh, folks from the dis disabled community and they together work on solutions and it's a great class and I encourage uh, any Stanford students who might be interested to grab, grab Dave outside. Thank you. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Katie and Stephen. I may have gone a hair long here, but um, we'll get you queued up here. Thank you. I think we're going to be good. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to um, collaborate with Stanford at both last year and this year. And uh, Stephen and I are the co-founders of Aging 2.0. And I just want to tell you a little bit about Aging 2.0 and why we're excited about this challenge. So Aging 2.0 is a global innovation platform. We really, our goal is to connect, educate, and support innovators who want to work in aging and long-term care. And a lot of the points that Ken mentioned, I think, really tap into our ethos, which is we really believe that it's going to take interdisciplinary, it's going to take intergenerational, and it's going to take international collaboration to really bring the smartest people together and focused on these challenges and opportunities of our aging society and a culture that needs to catch up. Um, so the role that Aging 2.0 tries to play is to really bridge these worlds, because I'm a PhD gerontologist by training, but I was an engineer in undergrad, and when I was an engineer, I went to conferences over here that talked about technology and engineering. And when I was studying gerontology, I went to gerontology conferences. And what we believe is that these groups need to come together. We also really believe that the older adults need to be involved in the process. Um, so this whole intergenerational aspect that Ken mentioned of we fundamentally believe that the people who understand the needs in this space the best are older adults themselves and the people who work with them every day. And so we're really passionate about bridging those folks who understand the needs with the people who can build stuff, you know, with the technologists and the designers. And that's really what this challenge is about and why we're so excited to bring students all around the world to focus on these needs. And we, last year we did cognitive impairment, which again, we feel like part of the role of the Stanford Longevity Center and Aging 2.0 is to shine the light on areas where we want to see more innovation, where the average student might not in their daily life think, hmm, today I'm going to ideate around cognitive impairment, or hmm, today I'm going to think about what it's like for someone in a wheelchair to navigate you know, Palo Alto. And so I think what we want to do is shine the light Say so there's huge need, huge opportunity, opportunity to do good and do well. You can solve important problems that are also a huge market opportunity. So personal mobility is certainly a very interesting topic. Um, Ken itemized a lot of reasons why exercise is critical for personal mobility. We know that exercise is important. We know that having muscle mass as you go into later life is really important for staying healthy and robust and kind of dealing with the challenges that come your way as you age. Um, Another thing that Ken mentioned is though this whole wearables trend and this whole fitness and wellness trend, we're seeing a lot of it getting applied to you know, triathletes and uber athletes when in fact a lot of this data collection could be really helpful um, when we're more trying to manage staying fit in later life. So we want to see that cut wearables and fitness monitoring come more into the aging space to promote wellness as we age. Um, the other kind of area, there's really three buckets we want people ideating around. The first is this physical activity um, exercise side. The second one is in the home. As we know, mobility around the home is such a huge challenge. Um, lots of barriers help inhibiting people from doing their activities of daily living in their homes independently as possible. And then the third one's really around the community. And we know the importance of staying connected in the community to staying socially connected. But oftentimes, our cities are not necessarily designed for aging populations and people with mobility limitations. So we think there's really a whole broad swath of opportunities that's really ripe for people to think about new innovations. One of the things we didn't do last year that we added in this year, which we think is really important, is again the voice of the consumer. So what we wanted to do is make sure we don't think we need to guess at what's needed. We think a lot of older adults, if we just ask them, could help us understand what the needs are. And that's really step one in design thinking is around, you know, put yourself in someone else's shoes, develop empathy for the end user, and really involving older adults in the innovation process we think is critical. So these are just some quotes. We put out a little survey to our consumer panel um, that we do some research with for Aging 2.0. And 
ask them just a couple, you know, do you guys have any ideas about mobility challenges? And of course, whenever we ask, the floodgates just get open. You know, everyone's got these pent up ideas they have and things that they think could be better. And so just a few, you know, thinking around the home, chairs are too low, toilets are too low, um, all the entrances have slopes, um, you know, that tennis shoes stick to the carpet. We really encourage student designers to, you know, why don't you go and rent a wheelchair for the day, right? And see what it's like to move around. Or why don't you do some empathy um, devices like changing your mobility and see what it's like to move around your home, or changing your visibility, sorry. So Stephen is gonna take us through a few of the innovations um, that we're seeing in the market already to inspire some ideas, but really we think that we wanna see your ideas come January or December, um, that what students have to think about these new ideas. So thanks so much. Uh, indeed. So yeah, so we have uh, now this global network and we've been seeing over the last uh, couple of years over a thousand startups and some of them have been in the mobility space and uh, we co constantly meet more interesting innovators from big companies and small companies. So here's just a selection uh, that illustrates the breadth of, of, of innovation. So Sabi is a local company that uh, some of you might know. It's sort of taking something really quite simple, say let's just reinvent a cane. Let's make a cane actually co cool, stylish and something that you actually would actually like to be seen out and about in town. Simple idea, it doesn't have to have any technology, but it just can really take a different approach and really bring this idea of fashion uh, into the old adult market. This is another one, this is a Swedish, uh, Swiss company called Noni. Uh, there's a, a decadence uh, biomedical from um, Seattle that we know about too, which has this idea of an exoskeleton. So this actually is designed to help people, this is uh, designed for factory workers to help lift heavy objects, but also could be perfect for people with mobility issues, it basically becomes a, a chair that you can wear and you can set it so you can sit down uh, with this exoskeleton. Um, lots of different innovations happening here around giving superpowers to people using uh, different kinds of exoskeletons. This is a great little company uh, out of the UK called Oomph Wellness. Um, it's actually what he's demonstrating here is uh, uh, cheerleading in a chair. They've actually developed a whole wellness, a, a wellness and um, uh, the lifestyle program that they're selling into assisted living facilities in the UK uh, in a licensing uh, model. Making a lot of money, got some really great investment uh, in the UK and they're gonna be looking internationally. But this idea of just encouraging people to get active and get engaged and, and have fun while doing it, and it's also a money spinner. This is another company which is taking, uh, again from the UK, taking a different approach uh, to mobility. It's called Good Gym. It's actually, this is about um, having younger people uh, run around and as part of their um, gym, they uh, all start off together and they run off and they go and meet uh, an older person who's isolated. And so actually they then, to, for example, take some uh, washing or um, some, uh, pick up some shopping or just have a chat, have a cup of tea. But the idea here is that you're engaging intergenerationally, as Katie was mentioning, uh, but you're also allowing people to, uh, to be mobile. In this case, it's the younger people who are, who are the most active ones. But there's also ways that we can do uh, a lot of innovation around transportation and mobility. For example, Lyft. Has anybody just been using the Lyft Line app? Do people know what I'm talking about? Lyft? So Lyft and Uber are these wonderful new, uh, basically next generation taxi services that you can bring up and get your taxi to arrive on your, your mobile device. And the idea now uh, that both Lyft and Uber have developed is the social component, where they're actually creating a new model for public transportation where you can fill a car with two or three people and it's cheaper for everybody and it's more, more convenient and it's just a wonderful experience so this idea of creating social journeys i think there could also be some sort of interesting social engagements happening with these uh with, with, with this kind of uh, service mentioning for those who are interested to look up the age friendly cities initiative it's a really interesting project um by the World Health Organization and uh, a few cities in the, in the US um, now being sort of uh, uh, licensed or certified as, as age friendly, lots of different uh, ways in which a city can start to think through being more innovative and being more age friendly. And the big issue is we're seeing this re-urbanization uh, into, uh, into cities and a lot of older people, I, I just moved from New York and it's really a massive increase in the older population there and they're trying to figure out how they can improve uh, mobility around the cities and lots of interesting case studies and examples for, for the WHO. Similarly also interesting initiatives around the blue zones to make cities livable. Uh, and also something as simple as mobile apps. There's um, just a real 
um, uh, integration of the public transport systems into mobile devices now. So I don't have to wait in the rain for 10 minutes because I know the bus will be coming uh, now exactly in 30 seconds and I can just leave my house. So just these are interesting innovations that entrepreneurs are already doing to make life easier for everybody and it could be specifically relevant to older adults, but a lot of the time older adults don't even know that these are uh, possible and these exist. There's a couple more uh, different takes on it. There's, this is a company called WalkJoy. They have a little device that they strap to your leg and they can identify if you're going to be, if your gait is off and you're likely to be able to uh, to catch somebody before they fall. As we saw earlier, over one in three adults over uh, 65 uh, fall each year. Um, and then some slightly more sort of lateral thinking. Uh, there's some golf, there's a golf analysis here, which is designed to help you have a great golf swing. But again, it's using the power of a mobile phone and it able, allows you to be able to decide to see if you're actually as good a golfer as, as Tiger Woods. Uh, similarly, as a uh, Microsoft Connect is being using, used for uh, physiotherapy to allow people to improve the movements they have when they're at home. It saves cost in the system to not necessarily have to go all the time to have an in-person physiotherapist, but you can have some benefits to be able to identify whether you're doing the thing and the, the, the movement in the right way. Uh, some wonderful innovations in, in transportation, local sort of personal mobility. You might have seen the wheel wheelchair out there, which is uh, illustrated down here. Again, this looks nothing like what a wheelchair should look like. Really reinventing the idea of as Katie always says, big, version boring. This idea of um, products that don't have to live in the hospital. People actually want to use them. Uh, but I think this is a particularly cool idea here, the Firefly up here. Can you see it's a wheelchair which has a superpower. Uh, it's basically got a big battery pack on the front so you can zoom around town with your Firefly wheelchair and you can go twice as fast. How, how cool is that? This looks like terrific fun. I'd love to have a go. Um, this thing here called the kangaroo is a little uh, driving, you can drive your wheelchair into the car. Uh, there's another um, system here out of Jersey called the um, Agile Life pe uh, Personal Transportation System. It's just basically a, a combination wheelchair and bed. So one of the big issues is having, for example, a caregiver trying to do a uh, lift of somebody who might be heavy to get them from a wheelchair into the bed. Really, there's lots of complicated ways of people, uh, a lot of injuries that come of it. There's, there's a lot of um, complicated contraptions and hoilers. But this actually just has a smooth integrated one button connection between a wheelchair and, they, uh, and, and a bed. I'd be quite surprised if we developed anything quite that sophisticated within the next few months, but this idea is the design that we're interested in. And then just a couple of final ones. This is a great little company out of uh, um, down south, uh, I think it's Arizona or Texas, um, called Local Motors, and they run an innovation platform for mobility ideas. And so they develop these concepts, like again, this personal mobility pod, allowing people to get in and out of the car or the whatever this is sort of trike components in a completely different way to rethink what it means to be mobile. And this just made the headlines a, a couple of years ago, a couple of, uh, in the last few days actually, this entire car is printed from a block of plastic. It took them 44 hours on the 3D printer and the thing works. They entirely printed everything. So just think about that as a resurgence of American manufacturing or if I wanted to, this is obviously designed to be cool and young and uh, sort of uh, appeal to the, the hot rod racer, but how easy is it now to just build a new concept like this? So we'd love to see ideas, we'd love to sort of get this creative juices flowing. Um, and just a couple of final final words in terms of how we're going to do this. And uh, right now, as of today, the the uh, the system is now up and running. Uh, if you go to movedesign.skill.com, the link is up there. If it's not already, it will be shortly on the Stanford site. Uh, it's the same system we used uh, last year, and you'll be able to basically log in, you register, um, and then uh, put your uh, design uh, together. You're going to need to put the summary, put a, uh, uh, put a picture, put an image. There's a bunch of information that we need from you. Uh, in terms of the process, we're kicking it off today. Phase one is happening over the next uh, couple of months. Uh, the designs are due in December the 5th, and then we're going to spend... Uh, fun Christmas uh, with, our, with our wonderful phase one judges who are going to be reviewing the work over the next, uh, over the next few weeks. And then in January, we're going to be announcing these five to eight finalists. And then the process of mentoring happens. And then we're going to be connecting those five to eight finalists with the companies that have already announced the, the sponsorship, the targets, the ARPs, and the others who are interested in supporting this process. And we'll be pr uh, connecting uh, the mentors and the finalists to really sort of polish the next phase. Uh, of, of, the, uh, of, the, of, of the proposals that they're making and 
bring people in, as Ken mentioned, in here April the 9th uh, for another event and, uh, and the finals. So with that, just a final sort of mention that we're gonna be supporting through the Aging 2.0 network. We've now got 50 chapters in formation, 10 active around the world, and we've been pushing this messaging out around the, uh, to different countries, and we're getting also lots of ex excitement in, uh, in. As we heard, last year we had 52 submissions, 15 countries, and we're gonna try and uh, beat that uh, comfortably this year. That's our, that's our goal. So that's the final word. Just wanted to also mention Arnie Whitman has joined the Aging 2.0 team. He's around somewhere. There he is, wonderful. Uh, Arnie brings a tremendous amount of support. Um, he's got a lot of connections with his uh, private equity company that are really involved in the mobility space, so we're gonna be able to draw on those connections as well. So with that, we'll get down to the content. I will hand it back to Ken.